Welcome to Hillcrest Baptist Church for our Sunday evening worship service via live stream. We're so glad that you're able to watch via live stream on our website or on our Facebook. Please let us know if you need anything at all and let us know more about you by filling out the connection form found on our website at visithillcrest.org slash live. Also, don't forget to check in and let us know you're watching tonight's service. Before we get started, let us bow our heads in prayer and ask God to bless our evening service today. Our Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you once again for just a wonderful weekend and just a wonderful Sunday morning to worship you. And God, I pray that you would just be with the evening service tonight, be with the singing, be with the announcements, be with especially the preaching of your word. Speak to our hearts from your word and help us to make a decision to give you all the glory and honor. We thank you once again for this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Church family, we're going to sing a few songs. So let's begin with There is Power in the Blood. Sing it out loud. Think about the words that you sing. There is power in the blood. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There is power in the blood. Sing it out loud this evening. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There is power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you leave a victory win? There is wonderful power. singing this evening we're gonna sing another song showers of blessing showers of blessing we'll sing it on the very first and the second and the last there shall be showers of blessings we need mercy draws round us are falling but for the showers we play we'll sing it first. there shall be showers of blessing this is the promise of love there shall be seasons refreshing sent from the savior of us church family let's grab our bibles and let's get ready for the preaching of god's word tonight amen great singing tonight and what a powerful truth that is as we think about the truths that we find within the scriptures concerning our savior the lord jesus christ well tonight we have the awesome privilege once again 
to hear from Pastor David Tice, and he's going to be preaching and teaching this evening on the subject of the family. And so let's open our hearts, let's have our Bibles ready, and let's prepare to hear from the Word of God. Well, welcome to the Sunday evening service of Hillcrest Baptist Church. It was a pleasure to be with you in services this morning and to share with you this continuing study on the family. Tonight, we're going to talk about setting family goals. Listen, there is no more important institution on the planet than the family. God established the family, and God wants your family to succeed. God wants you to have a happy family. God wants you to have a family that honors Him. Our, our whole purpose for existence is to represent Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, the Bible says this, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. But the Bible doesn't tell us until a couple verses after that, verse 20, why, we're, why we were recreated, why we became new creatures in Christ. The Bible says in verse 20, now then, we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We got saved so that we can represent Jesus Christ. And that's not just true of our in individual lives, that should be true of our families. Our families are here to represent Jesus Christ. In Ephesians, Paul the Apostle says that our, pitch, that our, our families, the husband-wife relationship, is a picture of Christ and the church. So the church, or so the, so the family is so, so vitally important because it represents to the world the love of Jesus Christ. It is God's plan for the propagation of the human race. God created one man, one woman for one lifetime. God wants them to be together. And God, listen, when God created the, the, the marriage relationship, he said to Adam, look, you'll leave your father and mother and cleave unto your wife and you two will be one flesh. Absolutely essential that God said, look, this is something that you're going to, this is something you're going to have to work at. This isn't something that's just going to take place naturally. He had to tell Adam and Eve, in their innocent state, before sin had come into the world, you need to stay together. Marriage is something that you work at. The family is something you work to build, and you have to make determinations to make your family successful. And so we're going to talk about setting family goals. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, he said in verse, uh, he says in verse 13, after talking about his background and talking about his life and talking about the fact that he counted all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, when we come to verse 13, Paul says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. That is, I've not, I don't feel like I'm, I, I am like Christ yet. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reach, reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What's he saying? He's saying, I determined in my life that more important than anything else, I want to be like Christ. Can I encourage you as you listen to this message to make a determination that you want your family to be a Christ-like family, a kingdom family, a family that on this earth represents our God represents Jesus Christ and all that he wants to do. That's what God wants for us. I'm going to talk to you. Paul said, that's my goal. That's the goal that I'm setting for my life. Let me encourage you to set that as a goal for your life. And as we talk about setting family goals, before we get started, let's pray. Father, I would ask that you would teach us tonight. I Teach us. I pray for every couple, young and old, that's listening to this message, that Father, they'll we'll learn some things about how to set goals so that our family will reflect you to a lost and hurting world. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to talk about setting goals in five different areas. Number one, I want you to see this, that you need to Set time management goals. I, I met my wife when I was in Bible college. When I first went to college, I uh, had determined I, I was young as a Christian, and I just really wanted to serve the Lord with my whole heart and mind. And uh, uh, I, 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 said, I said to myself, I, I'm not going to. I am not going to even look at a girl for 
for four years. All I'm going to do is study the Bible. I'm going to meditate on the Word of God. I'm going to get to know God. I made that commitment in September. In October, I met Anna, uh, and uh, I, I, I began to sit with her. She, she, I would get on the bus uh, on our, our, um, our campus. Was, it, our school was brand new, and so where our, our, our dorms were were different than where the, the actual classroom campus was. So we had to leave our, our dorms by bus and take buses across town to where the church campus was, and we met on the church campus for, for classrooms. And so every morning I would get up, I worked my way through college, I was a dishwasher, and I'd get up at five o'clock in the morning, go wash dishes, and then I'd go get cleaned up, and then uh, I'd, I'd jump on the bus. I didn't like to stand in line waiting for a bus to pick me up, and so uh, I stand in line while everybody else was getting on the bus, I would wait till the line was down to nothing, and then I would be the last person on the bus. My, my wife now, uh, my girlfriend back then, in fact, the girl I didn't even know, she had spotted me. And I didn't know that she had spotted me. She had spotted me, and she wanted to get to know me. And uh, so she was just the opposite of me. And isn't that the way it is? Opposites attract. She, she was just the opposite of me. She was the person to be the first person in line at the bus. And so what, before the bus got there, she would be at the head of the line. She would get on the bus, and she would go down about five or six rows, and she would uh, sit down on the bus. Now, the bus seat has room for two people on it, but uh, she didn't want anybody else to sit by her. She wanted me to sit by sit by her. And she had watched, she had watched uh, my pattern for several days and realized that I was always the last person on the bus. So she would get on, little petite thing, she would get on the bus and she would sit next to the window and then she would take all of her books for her classes that day and she would set them next to her and then she would look out the window um, and not, like, she's not paying attention. And as she, uh, and people would walk by and nobody wanted to say to her, could you move your books so I could sit there? And so she would, she would keep them sitting there until I got on the bus. And when I got on the bus, right before I got to her row, she would pick up her books and put them on her lap. And then I would see her sitting there by herself. Now, I thought this was the providence of God. I thought that God uh, had just wanted me miraculously to meet this girl. I did not know it was a woman's manipulation to meet a man. And uh, uh, so she, what she had done is she had made plans to meet me. That's how we met. And we started meeting. Uh, we started every day. We were riding together on the bus uh, two classes and then from classes back home. We actually had a couple of, of seats uh, or a, a couple of classes together, and we would be sitting very close to each other. And uh, uh, I remember oh, for, a, for a matter of, of uh, weeks, I said to myself, man, I told God I wasn't going to date anybody for the next uh, four years. I was just going to focus on studying the Word of God. And, uh, and after about two or three weeks, I said to myself, Wow. I, I said to my roommate, I said, you know what? I keep meeting this girl. And he said, yeah, I know. She's pretty. And I said, I said, but I told God, his name was Wayne. I said, Wayne, I told God that I wasn't going to date anybody for four years. And he said, that's good. And I said, why is that good? He said, because if you don't date her, I'm going to. And I took that as God's leading in my life to ask her out uh, real soon. Well, we started dating and we dated for the next three and a half years. And uh, then 10 days, her mother said, you cannot marry her until you graduate. Ten days after we graduated, we got married, and we have been married now for over 43 years and serving the Lord together. Now, while we were dating, while we were dating, uh, one of the things that attracted me to her the most was the fact that she loved the Lord. She talked about the, the Lord. She, she uh, asked me to pray for her family. She she was interested in what I wanted to do, and we shared goals. We talked about, about uh, uh, what was important to me and what was important to her. We talked about uh, uh, raising a family. We talked about uh, uh, where we would serve. I talked to her about my burden to come out to Las Vegas and start a church. Uh, we talked about getting married. We talked about having a family. We talked about starting a church. All those things we talked about. 
Uh, and, and, and in that, we, we determined that we needed to set certain goals. And even before we were married, we were setting goals about what we were going to do when we got to Las Vegas. We talked about door knocking. We talked about uh, uh, f- making flyers. We, we would learn things in class and talk about how we were going to implement that in starting a church in Las Vegas. I'm just telling you, setting goals is so, so important. So what goals do we set? Number one, I already said this, we should set time management goals. What do you mean by that? I mean this, when you get involved in ministry, you're going to be very, very, uh, in ministry or anything in life, if you're like me, you may be a workaholic. There's There are things that will take you. They're going to just take up your time, take up your time, take up your time. This morning, I got up at 5, uh, about 5 o'clock this morning, uh, just in order to be able to get here, and we have been going uh, uh, for every hour of this day, there's been something that has filled my time, even preparing for this message. I know this, that if I don't set time for, for things that are important, then those important things are going to be pushed to the side. Uh, when, when we moved to Vegas, my wife and I soon realized that there's going to be many, many demands on our time. And so we went off to the desert. We just took a walk out in the desert. In fact, near a place called Lake Mead here in Las Vegas, we walked out on the cliffs and we were just looking at the lake and we were looking at the desert. And we, we said, let's sit down and set, set time management goals. What are we going to do? What is going to be our priorities? And so we, we, we determined we were going to manage our time. We weren't going to allow time to manage us. We were going to manage our time. We weren't going to allow the hurriedness of life to squeeze us out of each other's life. So we decided that we were going to take every Monday off. And that that was at a time where people were saying, look, you need to work seven days a week, 24 hours a day. You need to burn out for Jesus. I've never believed that was right. I don't believe God wants us to do that. I think God wants us to totally, completely sell out to him and that 24 hours a day of our life belongs to God. But God wants us to use the time the way he has designated. And that means that I need to spend time with my wife. Uh, God tells us in Proverbs that our wife, the wife of our youth, is a blessing from him. That whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing. And so therefore, if God's given me a wife, it's my responsibility to take care of her. We decided before we ever had children, we were going to spend Monday together. We weren't going to answer the phone. We weren't going to get involved with other people's lives. We were just going to spend Monday together enjoying one another and, in, and, and enjoying life together, enjoying him together. Number two, uh, we decided decided we were going to take a two-week vacation every year. Now, we did not even have any income coming in, but we made that decision. We were going to at least take two weeks of vacation every year. And I'm going to talk about planning your vacation in just a few minutes, but we decided that was important. Why? Because, listen, my, my, first, my, my first priority in life, and I'll talk about this in a minute, is my relationship with God. My second priority in life is my relationship with my wife, and I needed to have that time with her. Now, Tuesday through, through Sunday, our time was dedicated to building the church, to establishing the church. Uh, we, on Tuesday through Friday in the morning, I would study. I took time to study. On, on uh, uh, Tuesday through Friday in the afternoon, every day, we went out and knocked on doors. Uh, we tried to knock on 100 doors a day, and we did that for weeks and weeks and weeks. On Tuesday evening, we had visitation. On Wednesday night, we had church. On Thursday night, we had discipleship groups. She had a a ladies' growth group, and I had a men's growth group, and we worked with them. On Friday evening, we had youth activities, and we were the uh, we, we, when you start a church from scratch, you're the, uh, you're the pastor, you're the associate pastor, you're the janitor, you're the everything. I was the youth director. and We had, we had uh, youth that would come over, and what we did was we had youth activities every Friday evening. And uh, 
Uh, I can remember, in fact, I remember when Matthew was about three years old, my oldest was about three years old. One day he was sitting around the house and he was a little bored and he said, dad, let's go get the other teenagers. And you say, what do you mean the other teenagers? He's three years old. Yep. He spent so much time with teenagers over our house. He thought he was a teenager at three years old. Um, and he wanted to go have fun and, and teenagers meant fun. So he said, let's go get the other teenagers. We involved our children in every aspect of our ministry. And uh, because of that, they grew up not resenting the ministry. Uh, they, they, they grew up enjoying ministry. So we took Friday evening with uh, youth activities. We Saturday, all day long, we would visit. And we would take our kids and push them as they got older. Uh, we would have them walk alongside of us, and we would go as a family. We would go door to door. Today, uh, in our church, before COVID hit, uh, we started. We used to once a month have family a church-wide soul winning where we invite the entire families to come out and go knocking on doors as we have always done as a family together. So Saturday was visiting, Sunday was all day church. By nature, I am, I am, an, I am a workaholic. By nature, I, 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 I do these things and my, my uh, work schedule would have been so filled if I had not planned Mondays, if I had not planned vacations, if I had not planned to spend uh, at least an hour a day with my family uh, when, when we did, didn't have a day off, uh, I, was, I would have neglected my family. So I would say this, you need to have time management goals in your life. And then you need to schedule that time based on your priorities, based on what is important. I talked about priorities just a minute ago. What are my priorities? My Number one is my relationship with God. Uh, when and where are you going to spend time with God? I like to get up in the morning because, uh, because I know that by about 8 o'clock in the day, I'm going to have demands on my life, and it's going to continue to 8 or 9 o'clock at night. So I get up. Uh, years ago, I had a professor who said to me, if you don't get up early, you'll not spend time with God. And so I started getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning to spend time with God. I, 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 I call it getting up to get down. Get out of bed so you can get down on your face and you can worship God. Uh, when are you going to do that? And where are you going to do that? You got to have a place in your house. Uh, Jesus refers to the closet. Find a place where you can be alone with God and you can spend time with God. That's your number one priority. You're not going to be the right type of husband. You're not going to be the right type of father. You're not going to be the right type of wife. You're not going to be the right type of mother until you spend time with God. So, uh, so find that time. Number two, when and where are you going to spend time with your wife? Your wife is, is the most important disciple that you have. You need to send, spend time with her. Uh, wives, you need to spend time with your husbands, and it needs to be quality time. You need to have time. Um, my wife and I are very busy. We serve the Lord together, but I need a time when I'm going to pray with her. And uh, quite frankly, the time that we pray together is right before we go to bed at night, right before I nod off to sleep. But I'm going to make sure that I spend time with my wife. You should have a time set aside, a dating night, a once a month or once a week, a time where you say, this is my wife's time. Uh, I have so many preacher friends who have totally messed up their life with their, with their families because they never spend time with their wife. Your wife needs your attention. She didn't marry you to be away from you. She married you to be with you. The Bible says, uh, Jesus, uh, I'm sorry, the Lord, the Lord God said to Adam, he said, look, you will leave your father and mother and you will cleave unto your wife. The, the word cleave there means to stick with her like glue. Jesus used the term joined together. What God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. You need to be with your wife. You need to serve with your wife. You need to pray with your wife. And you just need to enjoy time with your wife. So number two, your wife. Number three, your children. Uh, your children. Your, your wife is your first physical priority on this, on this earth. But your, your wife and you, you, you and your wife together, your number one priority together as a husband and wife are your children. They need to be with you. You need to be with them. You need to pursue the hearts of your children. You need to, they need to know how much you love them. You want to be with them. And uh, they need to know that they are, they are number one to you and your spouse together. Children, 
are your third priority. Number four, others. When and where are you going to spend time with others? I just want you to understand that if you don't have that time set aside for God, you'll neglect it. If you don't have that time set aside with your wife, you'll neglect her. If you don't have that time set aside for your children, you together will neglect them. And so I would encourage you to put them first. Then you'll find that you have time for others. And as God provides the time, you'll be able to minister to others. You should spend no less than an hour per, per, per day with your family. And I'm not talking about your day off. I'm talking about the other days of the week. My family, my daughter used to refer to Monday as our day off. And that's how they looked at it. There was a time where we were off together as a family. So number one, set time management goals. Number two, set standards in your life and goals for those. Set standards in your life. What do you mean by that? I mean this. My wife and I were, were raised on two different ends of the country. I was raised in a desert. She was in Las Vegas, Nevada. She was raised in Pennsylvania, in the beautiful hills of Pennsylvania. She lived uh, in, on an acre of property surrounded by woods on two sides and and with a creek fu- uh, that went right by our house on the other side. She's a beautiful country girl raised in a beautiful area of the country. I, when I talked to her about coming to Las Vegas, she said, what's it like to be in the desert? I said, listen, this is what you need to do. You go, you go uh, to your oven and you turn it up to 350 degrees. And let it totally and completely preheat open it up and stick your head inside. That's what it's like living in the desert in the summertime. Now, it's wonderful during the winter. But she'd never experienced anything like this. Uh, we, it was, it's a totally different culture. Her culture was country living. My, country, my, my culture was city living here in Las Vegas. We had came from totally two, two different backgrounds. Then we were trained. She was from the Northeast. I'm from the Southwest. We were t- trained in the Southeast. In the Southeast, their their culture is totally different than our culture is here. Just like your culture in California is different than than other cultures anywhere, uh, anywhere in the world in Southern California. Uh, it, it, we need to understand that um, that because of that, and if we come from different places, we're we're going to have different standards of what is right and what is wrong. We had to decide what our standards were based on our on the Bible and the context in which we lived. So that meant this. We were going to have to decide what our standards were for dress. Being in the Southeast, there was a certain way that people dressed when they came to church. Out here, it was different. And uh, so we had to make a decision what was going to be appropriate and what wasn't going to be appropriate. And we, our decision was based not on some social standard, but on modesty. We wanted to make sure that, that we were not forcing anything on the culture that was around us, but that we were going to dress in such a way that our standards of our life would affect people as they came to church. They would watch us so that anybody could come to our church dressed any way but we would be dressing and we would lead by our lifestyle. So you have to do that. For your family, what are your standards? What are your standards of dress? You need to decide where where where, where you're going to live and how you're going to live. Uh, There are some people, I have some good friends that lived down in Southern California for many years, and they lived right in the heart of the city in Newport Beach. We were talking to them one day, and she said, I love living where we live. We live right in the heart of the city. I love being able to go to, to take the elevator down from our apartment and go out into the, out into the city and just walk over to, to this store or that store. To me, that would be like living in a purgatory, if not Hades itself. Living downtown in the middle of a congested city, I would think, man, this is crazy. I have missionary friends who've been in Japan, and they show me the pictures of Japan and where they live there and the way it is. I think, man. Well, you, you might think, well, you live in Las Vegas, Nevada. We live on the edge of Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, I like living on the edge. Uh, we live on the edge of Las Vegas, Nevada. We live, uh, when you walk out my housing development, we're out in the desert. We go for walks in the desert. We like it that way. Um, 
my wife from the country, uh, she, she liked that. When we, got, when we got married, we said, hey, what do we want to live? And let me, let me sit, speak to the men right now and say this. You ought to allow your wife to determine where it is that you want to live. You ought to be able to, and I'm not saying the particular house, I'm saying what area of town or where, what, what geographic area. Uh, if your wife likes to live in the middle of the city and you say, I'm not particularly like that, then you ought to let her choose where she's going to nest because she's going to be there a lot more than you than you're going to be. So I would, I would encourage you, decide what your standards are, decide um, uh, where you're going to live and how you're going to live and what those things are going to be. Then decide what you are and not what you are not going to participate in as a family. There are certain things that that my wife never did as a family or never did when she was growing up and things that I always did when I was growing up. I think particularly I I, I like to watch TV. I liked watching science fiction shows. I loved every Saturday morning when I was a kid they had cartoons on and my favorite cartoons were Bugs Bunny and the Roadrunner. Well, my wife grew up hearing that that cartoons were sinful. They were like pornography. They were horrible. Then you should never watch cartoons. So she got married to me and uh, I'm saying, hey, did you ever see this? No. She got to watch two shows when she was growing up. They didn't even have a TV in their, in their living room. They had a, they had a, uh, uh, their friend, their next door neighbor, which was like a, uh, like a half a mile away up the hill, had a television. And on Saturday, she could go and watch Roy Rogers and she could watch Timmy and Lassie. And uh, interesting story, when, when my uh, when we were adults, we took our children to go to the Roy Rogers Muse- Museum when it was in Victorville, California, and we met Roy Rogers, and my youngest son, Joshua, saw Roy Rogers, and he said, are you really Roy Rogers? And we were in his, in his museum all by ourselves, and he said, yes, son, I am. He said, my mother's in love with you. My mother wants to marry you. And my wife's getting beat red. And he said, well, I broke a lot of young girls' hearts uh, when I got married to Dale. But, we, uh, but th- th- that's what she got to watch, those two shows. Anything else was demonic. So uh, we, we, what were we going to do? Well, we had to decide. When we had children, were we going to allow them to watch cartoons or not? And we came to a conclusion that we would allow them to watch watch. Uh, cartoons as long as dad was present. You know what that did? That made my kids anxious to have me home uh, in the afternoon so we, so we could do something really spiritual like watch cartoons. <laughs> and, uh, but we had the opportunity. Uh, what, we, what we did was we decided together on these goals, these entertainment goals, these, these, um, what we were going to participate in, what we were not participating in. You know, we, I, we live in Las Vegas, Nevada. We had to decide together as a family, were we ever going to go to buffets in a casino? Were we ever going to go to a bowling alley if it was part of a casino? Or We had to make those decisions. We had to make decisions about whether we're going to go to a movie or we're not going to go to a movie. You have to make those, you have to make those standards. You have to determine those things for your family. And then if you set these standards in your marriage, I want you to understand what will happen. If you together as a husband and wife set uh, standards, this is right, this is wrong, this is what you're going to do, and then you stick by those standards, what it will do is it will build stability in your life. Don't contradict your spouse. Be, be consistent in agreeing together, uh, agreeing together that this is what you're going to do. And what it will do is it will help build stability. When parents disagree in front of their children about this is all right and that's not all right and this and when they're fighting back and forth about those things I want you to understand it builds a double mind in their minds they they, they they're double minded and the bible says a double man is un, a double minded man is unstable in all this ways so i encourage you number 2 set standards in your life these are goals you need to set number 3 set spiritual goals in your life Set spiritual goals in your life. What do you mean by that? Well, I talked about this a little bit. But you need to ask yourself, when am I going to spend time with God? Don't let that be something you add on to the day. Let that be something that is deliberately in your life. That you're going to, you're going to read the Word. Uh, listen, we live in a day and age where there's never an excuse 
not to have some part of the Bible in your life somehow during the day. You can go on, you can, you can, if you've got a, any type of smartphone, and I tell people my, my phone is much smarter than I am, but if you have any type of smartphone, you can, you can uh, download uh, Bible apps. You can listen to the Bible. You can get the Bible on CD. You can still do that. You can get the Bible on DVD. You can listen to the Bible all the time. You should be hearing the Word of God or reading the Word of God. I'm a slow reader, so I used to read through the Bible once a year. But then when I found out, this was years ago, that I could get it on cassette tape, I started listening to the Bible, and I started listening to the Bible more than once a year. Now, with my iPhone, I listen to the Bible about four times a year. I just started in Genesis again today uh, for, the, for the fourth time this year. Why? Because I want the Bible in my mind. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the kind of person that sits down and concentrates. I'm listening to the Bible as I'm getting ready for, for, uh, for, for church or getting ready for work or whatever I'm doing. But you need to have something. I know I'm going to listen to the Bible every day. I know I'm going to study the Bible. I know I'm going to pray every day. And I know the time. My wife can get up any morning uh, when there's nobody else in the house, can come can walk over and she find me in the same place because I'm going to be there praying. Uh, she, she knows that. Uh, when, uh, when, uh, so ask yourself spiritually, when are you spending time with God? When are you praying with your spouse? I told you a little, a little while ago that I pray with my spouse uh, before I go to bed at night. We spend time uh, praying together. And, and then I don't, that's not the only time we pray. My, my wife, anytime she's thinking about the kids, she's always saying, David, pray for, uh, pray for uh, your kids. We have, uh, we have one of our, 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 our daughter, Charity, and her husband, Neil, and our four grandchildren just flew out to Florida. They're, they're on a missions trip to Walt Disney World. And uh, so they're, they're, she said, pray for them. You know, pray that everything goes well on the plane. Pray, pray that they don't get COVID. She'll just ask me to pray. And right then I stop and I pray. I just say, dear Lord Jesus, I want to pray for Neil and Charity. I want to pray for Trey and Cherish and Lincoln and Felicity. Keep them safe as they're going. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You say, it's just, doesn't that sound trite? Yeah, the devil tells you that sounds trite. God just wants you to ask him for things. And so I, we do it right then. Uh, so I encourage you, when are you going to pray with your wife? When will you pray with your kids? I, can, I cannot tell you how important this is that you pray with your kids. I covered this this morning, uh, so I'm not going to go through it. But you praying for your kids and your kids hearing you pray, Oh, man, it's so, so vitally important. My kids know that God answers prayer. And one of the reasons they know God answers prayer is they've heard me pray for things and they've seen God answer prayer. You need to pray for your kids every day. I have, I have 30 family members. There's, I, I have 18 grandchildren. I have, uh, I pray for them by name every single day. I encourage you. Pray for your kids and pray with your kids. Let your kids hear you pray for them. You don't have to be super spiritual about this. When I walked in and prayed for my kids, I would sometimes be like a fallen asleep saying, Dear Lord Jesus, I pray for Matt and Josh and Charity and Faith and Hope. I pray they'll live for you. I pray they'll serve you. And I pray, Father, they'll just uh, sleep well tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I wanted them to hear me pray for them. Your kids need to hear you pray for them. Set your spiritual goals. How often are you going to be in church? Oh, this is so, so important. Listen, God has given you Hillside Baptist Church as a place where you can be fed the Word of God, where your children can grow up and have the encouragement of other children, where your teenagers can have other teenage friends. It is so important that you be in church. God knew what he was doing when he established the church. I said a few minutes ago that God established three institutions. He established the family, he established the government, and he established the local church. The local church is there to strengthen your family. Do not miss out on what God has for you. Get your kids in a local church. Years ago, I had a guy say to me, he was getting ready to move out of Las Vegas. He had been in the city for for five years. He'd gone to our church, and he, he was getting ready to leave. And by the way, this guy had a master's degree in theology. He knew the Bible. He came to me, and he said, you know, Pastor, he said, I, I really have blown it while I've been in Las Vegas. He said, every Friday night there were youth activities. There was always something going on for our teenagers, 
and I didn't get them involved. And he said, I'm concerned about what's going on with my kids. Don't let that happen. Your kids are going to surround themselves around something or someone. Let them surround themselves around the local church and their friends in the local church. Well, can't there be rotten kids in the local church? Yeah, they may be yours. <laughs> they may be mine. But I'm telling you that this, you're going to find better influences in church than you're going to find out in the, out, out in the neighborhood and, and, and in the public school. I just encourage you. Get your children. Have that as a spiritual goal. How do, you, how do you plan to affect spiritual growth in your children's lives? Ask yourself that question. What are you going to do to get them to grow spiritually? Uh, listen, you can, you can teach them. Uh, you, 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 are you going to have de devotions with them? We had, we had them go through a Becca Christian school. We homeschooled our children and used the Abeka video curriculum once, once they got into the sixth grade. So every day they had Bible devotions. Every Sunday or every Wednesday they were in Awana. Every Sunday morning they were in Sunday school. They were surrounded. That, this was all part of our, our spiritual development for them. We surrounded them with Christians. They, we had Christian heroes for them, preachers and teachers that we knew were their heroes. If there was a sports figure, Matthew was a big guy into sports. And so if, there was a, if we ever heard of a Christian sports figure like Tim Tebow today, we would say, hey, man, this guy's a Christian. And we would we'd get posters of them and we would talk about them. We'd get books by them. Dave Dervecki, I remember that name. Uh, uh, I'm thinking Mike Singletary. I think that's a name that I remember. Uh, but uh, these were people with Christian testimonies that uh, we wanted our kids to, to, to follow. Uh, political figures, uh, uh, preachers. Again, we made these people our, he our children's heroes because uh, we wanted to affect their spiritual growth. What ministry are you involved in together with your kids? Look, we, I just told you, we took our kids soul winning. Everything that we did, we did with our children because we wanted them to be involved in ministry. But I covered that a little bit this morning as well. Number, number, number four, set your vacation goals. Now, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go through these pretty quick. But you need to understand uh, a vacation is, uh, is a great opportunity to minister to your children. What, find out, uh, f first of all, how much time are you going to set, spend on vacation? We determined before we ever had children, we were going to spend at least two weeks for vacation. As they got older, we spent three weeks on vacation. Now, I'm telling you, as a preacher, people have said, you, how can you take a vacation? People are dying and going to hell. I want you to understand that my number one priority is ministering to my family, and ministering to my wife, and then to my wife and I, our number one priority is ministering to our children. If I'm not ministering to them, then I'm not an effective minister. But my children need to come first. So, so a three-week vacation is nothing when I think about the fact that these are my number one priorities. Uh, and I'm not going to ne neglect them. I've watched preachers neglect their family to grow the church. And it, all it does is hinder them later on in life. And how sad it is when a preacher's kid says, oh, I wish my daddy would spend time with me. Look, uh, you, you need to ask in your vacation, where do you want to go? Ask them where they want to go. Ask them what they want to do. For the first uh, probably 10 years of our lives together, our vacations were always to grandma's house. And that was great. We made it the biggest thing in the world because that's all we could afford. We got in our little car. We drove across country. We got to grandma's house in Pennsylvania, and we ate her food, slept in her beds. And that's, what, that's how we lived. We decided we were going to have vacation no matter what. We didn't have money for a new tent. We borrowed tents from other people. We didn't have... Uh, uh, money for motels, so we, we, we camped out in tents and sleeping bags or slept in cars going across country. That's what we did because we were determined we were going to spend time with our kids. They may not remember all the places we took them, but they remember we spent time with them. And we have some great memories. Uh, and then you, ha you have to ask yourself, what can you afford to do? I told you just a few minutes ago, vacations don't have to be expensive. Uh, uh, you just have to decide what you can afford and then take what you can afford and do what you can do. And if you've got in-laws that have got food, it's a great place uh, to go and spend time. By the time the vacation's over, they're glad you're gone. You got to be with them. You're glad you were with them. You're, they're glad you're gone and you get to go home and you'll enjoy your home uh, again. Let your kids be involved in planning the vacation. Find out what a 10 is to each one of your kids. For, for, for my son Matthew, if we could go to a ball game, that was a 10 for him. 
If for my son Joshua, if we could f find a fishing hole, that was a 10 for him. For the girls, if we could find a mall anywhere in America, that was a 10 for them. I remember one time we went to, uh, was down, we were going to go to Magic Mountain. We got in the car, we got, went all the way down to Magic Mountain. There was a sleep in by Magic Mountain. We slept there that night. And I, the next morning I got up and I thought about walking around Magic Mountain. I thought, hey, you guys want to go? And they said, uh, yeah. And then they were talking about things they want. I said, listen, I said, would you rather take the money that we, we're going to use to buy tickets for Magic Mountain and just go to a mall and, and shop all day long at a mall for whatever you want with that money, or would you rather go to Magic Mountain? And I thought they'd say, we want to go to Magic Mountain, and I was wrong. They wanted to go to a mall, so we went to the Ontario Hills Mall, and we, we shopped all day, and they had a ball. But we, got, we, we did that because that was their choice. So find out what a 10 is for them, and then uh, I, I tell you this, as a pastor, a stay vacation or a staycation, they call them, uh, doesn't work for me. Being in the same town where I can bump into people that know me or, or be called on, uh, that, didn't, that doesn't work for me. It may work for you, but it didn't work for me. We need to get away where people can't get in touch with us and they think, oh, he can't come across country. Uh, that's why we would always take vacations away. But set your goals for your vacation. And then lastly, set financial goals. People have... I, I tell people in marriage, there's five areas of conflict. Number one is a lack of communication. Number two is uh, sex. Number three is, uh, is financial goals. And number four is your children. People fight about their children, how their children should be raised. And number five is in-laws, allowing in-laws to become outlaws and fight, fighting about those things. Look, set your goals financially. Set your goals. Um, People will fight about whether or not they should tithe. You need to talk together about whether you believe in tithing. I am a firm believer that Christians should tithe and that God will bless them if they tithe. You need to get with your spouse and agree on, on whether or not you're going to tithe and, and, and what your tithe is going to entail. You need to talk, talk to him about, uh, talk to your spouse about giving uh, uh, beyond your tithe. Uh, let these set goals in these areas of giving. My wife and I determine what we're going to give in the area of missions, what we're going to give in the area of week by week giving. God, when we first got married, we determined we were going to tithe. We were already giving to missions and we were determined we were going to continue to do that. Because of that, God has blessed us immensely. What are you going to give to Faith Promise Missions? We just had our Faith Promise Conference in our church in Las Vegas and uh, we decided we were going to give so much and we're giving that. There, so there's no resentment uh, when uh, the money goes out because we've agreed together that this is what we're going to do. Uh, descent, de make decisions and, and set goals on food and clothing and what you're going to do with that. Set uh, decisions on your home, what kind of home you're going to live in. I have a friend who came, uh, he got married, he was raised here in Las Vegas, uh, and he didn't, decided he didn't want to live a life of poverty all of his life. So what he was going to do is he was going to build a house. He built a house. He worked for a construction company. In his spare time, he built himself a house, bought a piece of property, built himself a house. And when he, after he built the house, they moved in uh, for a little while, for about six months, and then they turned around and sold that house at an extremely great profit because he had put all the labor into the house. He built it himself. Once they did that, once they sold that house, they turned around and invested the money in another house. They did that three or four times until the last house he lived in, he had built, was a million-dollar house. He then sold that house, and, uh, and it, it took him a period of, oh, it had to be 18 years because his oldest child was ready to go to college. And so he sold that house and moved across the country, bought a piece of property and a house, and, uh, and has been able to put his children through college because he planned on what he was going to do with their home. And they're living very comfortably, as far as I know, and doing very well, and their children are all graduated from college. Plan your future. Make, what, are, what are your future goals financially? What are the investment goals? I would recommend that you listen to Dave Ramsey. Go through his Financial Peace University. And get uh, some good investment counseling. Look, you take these things and you put them together as a family. You take, you set these kind of goals. If you have goals in your family, then your family will know where they're going and that will cause a peace and a contentment. And even in times of strife, even when there's times of difficulty, you're going to find yourself 
You're going to find yourself making it through those difficult times because you have a goal, you have a plan, you know where you're going as a family. Well, I hope this has been a blessing to you. I'm glad that I had the opportunity of being with you today. Uh, and I look forward to hearing what God does in your life. I hope you'll take heart to this message and that it'll be an encouragement to you today and in the years to come. Father, I thank you for the opportunity of being with the people of Hillcrest Baptist Church today. I pray you'll bless them. I pray they'll take this truth and apply it to their lives. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What a wonderful message that was as we were challenged once again concerning the institution of the family. I pray that was a blessing and a great encouragement to each and every one of us here this evening. Well, at this time, we're going to have a question and answer session with Pastor David Tice. And so I pray this could be a blessing to you and an encouragement once again as we have some questions for Pastor Tice concerning the subject of the family. All right, well, Pastor Tice, thank you so much for being here this weekend, and thank you for taking the time to minister to our church family. And uh, as we begin, could you let us know a little bit about yourself and just your uh, testimony and the ministry that God has raised up in Las Vegas? Okay, why? Uh, I was born and raised in, in the city of Las Vegas. I, was, uh, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior as a teenager and uh, felt burdened about the fact that uh, there was no, that I had to go to a public school because mm -hmm. I hung around some pretty rowdy people. Mm -hmm. And uh, after I got, uh, after I got uh, saved and wanted to do what was right, I thought, man, uh, I'm going back and uh, everybody's doing all this uh, mm -hmm. crazy stuff. And I mm -hmm. got this idea that I thought was a brand new idea that nobody had ever thought mm -hmm. of. I thought of, I could start a Christian school for Christian kids with Christian teachers, and then Christians wouldn't feel like they were pressured to do wrong. They'd feel like they were pressured to do right. And this was like a new concept to me. Mm. I was disappointed when I found out that it went on for years. But, uh, but uh, we, uh, I, so I went to Liberty University, which at that point was Lynch, Lynchburg Baptist College. And uh, while I was there, I met my wife. I met her. I made a commitment. I said, um, I'm not going to date anybody for at least four years. I'm just mm. going to be like a monk in a monastery and mm. focus on Jesus and read the Bible. And But man, I, after about three or four weeks, I kept seeing the mm. same girl and we kept sitting together and we kept being together. And, <laughs> and uh, I thought, man, maybe God wants me to do this, but, but I, but I already told God, I'm not going to do this. And, and uh, I, uh, I, I finally went to my roommate and I said, you know, I made a commitment to God not to date or, or look at a girl for, for four years. And he said, well, that's good. He said, because if you don't date her, I'm going to date her. And I, I felt that as a sign from God to date her. And so I started dating her. Her mother insisted that we, uh, that we graduate from college before we made any commitments. I mean, I'm the kind, when I saw her, I liked her. I thought, let's just get married, which would have ruined me, uh, quite frankly. But uh, I learned the principles of submitting to your parents, even when you're in college. And, um, and uh, so I submitted, and uh, we dated for three and a half years. And after that, uh, 10 days after we graduated, we got married. That was 1977. Mm -hmm. We moved out to Las Vegas, Nevada. We had no support whatsoever. Mm -hmm. We didn't know anything about deputation. Mm -hmm. Jerry Falwell used to say, just get out there and knock on doors and tell mm -hmm. people about Jesus, and yeah. God will bless you. And yeah. so, yeah. so that's what we did. We went yeah. out and knocked on doors and told people about Jesus. And for eight weeks, we knocked on 100 doors a day. It was, mm -hmm. My wife had never been to a desert. <laughs> and so it, when we, the first night we drove into Las Vegas, it was, uh, we went by one of those bank signs. A bank sign said 110 degrees. It was 10 o'clock at night and it was July 10th. Oh my goodness. And we said, and she said, oh my, what have I gotten myself into? But we, we, we put together a little brochure and we started knocking on doors. There was a church in town that decided to rent us a building. We didn't ask them to. Mm. They just called us and said, wow. can we rent you a building? Wow. So they rented us a, uh, a school building. And the truth of the matter is they only paid for it two, in two months. In two months, we were self-supporting. Mm. That was just from going door knock, door knock. We went door to door. And uh, again, we knocked out 100 doors a day. My wife had never been in the summertime mm. in Las Vegas. And uh, on September 11th, uh, 
which is a special day for us. <laughs> September 11, 1977, we began That's Liberty true. Baptist Church. And we had 68 people in services and two people Amen. trusted Christ as Savior. Amen. And uh, so from there, we, trans we went from one building to another, to another, to another. And God finally gave us a piece of property on the northwest part of the valley, yeah. and uh, which is now more in the middle of the city, but it was the extreme northwest. Sure. And uh, uh, we've just seen God work in one Amen. way. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for sharing that testimony and uh, just an awesome work that the Lord's doing there in Las Vegas. And, and we got to go there for deputation. Yeah. And uh, we had a great time for that missions conference and such an encouraging church, uh, such a gracious church as we met your church family. So well, thank, thank you, you so much for supporting our ministry here. So we have nice. very gracious people, very yes, giving, sir. kind people. Absolutely. So. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Well, we have a few questions for you here tonight uh, concerning the family okay. and uh, some on parenting and then also concerning the marriage relationship. So the first question that we have here is what were some mistakes? If you made any mistakes uh, as you were raising your children, what were some mistakes that you made in parenting that you would warn young parents about? Well, I can't think of any. <laughs> no, that's not true. You can just look back over your life and you say, man, I messed up here. I messed up there. Uh, but uh, I would say this, one of the big mistakes that we made was uh, at, when we were first uh, first in Las Vegas, we, uh, my mother, of course, lived there, and my brothers and sisters, um, I wasn't cautious enough mm -hmm. about um, uh, allowing my children to spend the night at somebody's house. Mm -hmm. We had people that we thought, hey, were trustworthy, but... You don't you don't know anybody's background, and, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm, right. I'm born and raised in Las Vegas, and so so I would say this that 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 I would be more, much more cautious. We would have we I remember one time my wife was having uh, my daughter had several of her friends spend the night at our house. We decided after a few years we said you know what we're not going to have our kids spend the night at anybody else's house they come back and they tell us things yeah, they right. watch say watch movies we would never let them watch or right. not, nothing horribly vile sure. but sure. but they would they would do things and, the, and we would hear about it and think man mm. uh, uh so we're not going to do that but we'll let them look we'll let them spend the night at our house mm. and then That's one right. night um one night I'm upstairs sleeping, and my wife just sort of tiptoed out to where the stairwell was, and she she sat and listened to my my daughter, uh, and the, and one and the couple of the girls that had come over that night, and they're talking to her and giving her an education about things that she wasn't ready to be educated no. about, <laughs> and uh, I just think it's a very very good policy that that you don't allow your children to spend the night. Mm -hmm. And people would say to me, they would call me a helicopter pilot or a helicopter parent that, <laughs> that I'm constantly, but I, I think today that you can't be protective enough mm -hmm. of your children. Mm -hmm. And yes, uh, no matter how much you're criticized about that, mm -hmm. I think your children are your number one, you and your wife's number one priority. Mm -hmm. And and therefore they need to be protected and, and you are the protector. Mm -hmm. you, just like I expect our president to protect our, our government in our borders, right. I am the only protection, and my wife is the only protection that our children have. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's amazing. It, uh, huge elephants won't let their babies mm -hmm. get away from them, and and they keep them until they are practically full grown next mm -hmm. to them, right. uh, lest a lion or something gets on them. Elephants, and they're and they're supposed to be dumb. Mm -hmm. Ele <laughs> elephants know better, and we we don't. So I would be more I would be more careful, more cautious. Mm -hmm. Again, my kids, we were very protective and we got harassed about it but i would just i'd be more conscious mm. and more protective right right yes sir yes sir now now along the lines with that is, is there is there a point where we can be overly protective or overly restrictive uh when it comes to our parenting i i again i'm i'm uh of the belief that you cannot be okay. protective yes, in our day. And I know yes, uh, there's a lot of people who would disagree with that. I just believe that, that mm. our children need protected. This is a vile, vile world that right. we live in. And our country right. is not the 1970s or 50s, mm. leave it to beaver thing. Mm. It's, a, it's a vile, vile thing. And right. you, your kids go out. Uh, now, we let our kids do things. Sure. We let our kids go. Uh, if, if there was a group of them going to... Mm. Uh, a mall or something like that, we would say, okay, wh which parent is going with mm -hmm. you? Right. Uh, but we, I always, I believe in parental supervision. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of kids get in trouble because parents want to be friends rather than be parents. Mm -hmm. And right. they don't want their, their kids to be offended. Well, yes, uh, I was told this, 
uh, I was told, Pastor Choi, that that my kids, when they got out of our house, would explode. They wouldn't be able to they wouldn't mm-hmm. be able to communicate with anybody outside the house. They wouldn't be able to understand anybody. Uh, that's just not the case. Mm-hmm. My my kids communicate very well, <laughs> doing <laughs> all sorts of things that's way it. beyond my my uh, my ministry. They are. It's amazing what they're doing. Mm-hmm. They were introduced to homosexuality. They were introduced to uh, pregnancy outside of wedlock. They were mm-hmm. they were introduced to heterosexual sin. They were introduced, but they were introduced with me present, mm-hmm. and we would discuss those things mm-hmm. so that we didn't we didn't protect them from information, mm-hmm. but we did protect them from the involvement of somebody that yes, was sir. wicked. Uh, yes. in their life. And and right. that could have been members of our church. Yes, sir. I, I've had people leave our church because I said, listen, our kids don't do well together. I would always say that. Mm-hmm. Our kids don't do well together. That way I wasn't accusing their kids of mm-hmm. being bad. They just, right. when they got together, they were doing things that sure. weren't good. Yes, and sir. So, yes, sir. So. Hey, Matt, no, no, that's very helpful. Thank you so much. Um, let me ask you next, another question here. How, how do you balance a, a busy career, your job, and then your responsibilities that you have with, at church, and then also your family time. And, and then with that question as well, uh, were there some activities or, or habits or, or maybe some traditions that you and your wife prioritized uh, within your family when you were raising your children? Okay, yeah, we, we decided, because I was raised spiritually mm. in the go, 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 grow, grow, grow mm. a mentality. Yes. And... Uh, I mean, we were we were associated with some of the largest churches mm-hmm. in America, being at Thomas Road Baptist Church, and then and then uh, I had the opportunity of having Dr. Hiles take me out and buy me a suit, mm-hmm. and uh, and we were worked. I was I helped start. I don't know if I helped start, but I I worked as a the youth director of a church that was planted in Burlington, North Carolina, mm-hmm. my last two years of college, right. and um, and. Uh, and that, that church became the fastest growing church in the oh, state wow. of North Carolina for two years. Well, that put pressure on us to go, 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 grow, grow, right. grow. Right. Yes, sir. And so I'm leaving there and I'm coming out to Las Vegas. And I, I saw some problems with that. Mm-hmm. And I just, I just, we determined we were going to take every Monday, mm-hmm. we were going to take 24 hours and we were going to, we were going to spend Monday together as a family. And it didn't matter what anybody else thought. We also determined we were going to take, uh, two week vacations. Mm-hmm. Now, I talk about that in the Sunday evening uh, message, but yes, we sir. took we took uh, we decided we were going to take a two week vacation every year, mm-hmm. and that's when people were saying to me, "You'll never do anything if you if you're that kind of you're a slacker. You never do oh, anything." Wow. I would go home in a couple evenings. Now, this is our schedule. Our schedule was was uh, uh, Monday we would take off. Mm-hmm. Tuesday, yes, uh, I would be studying and visiting in the afternoon. In the evening, my mm-hmm. wife and I would make two visits of people to visit the church. On, on Wednesday, we had church. On Thursday, we'd make two visits in the evening. My wife says we were crazy. <laughs> and then on Friday, there was no youth director, so I was the youth director. And we would have Friday, we had a Friday evening youth activities, yes, and then sir. Saturday was all this follow-up stuff. Okay. So there was a couple of things. Number one, we just prioritized and said our, our children are going to be number mm-hmm. one. I, I watched preachers ruin their kids, and, mm-hmm. and their kids resent the ministry. Our kids love the ministry. The mm-hmm. second thing is we involved them in the ministry. Oh, mm-hmm. So they served. They, if I went someplace, they went with me. If, uh, and again, I'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow, uh, uh, or I've already talked about that. <laughs> <laughs> So, yes, so where we went, they went because we wanted them to love ministry Amen. Amen. and not uh, not resent it. Amen. Amen. So. Now, Pastor Tice, I know you have five children yes. that that are faithfully serving the Lord. Yes. Uh, now, were there seasons, maybe during their teenage years, when there was a season of of rebellion or maybe an apathetic spiritual season, and uh, how did you minister to them during that time? Well, that's. I, I, I just, I, I think this, I yes. think that every human being on the planet has to deal with a spirit of rebellion. Yes. Satan, <laughs> Satan is a, uh, Satan has introduced mm. us to disobey God. I mean, that's, that's the way it is. We just would not allow rebellion. Mm. Um, I can remember, and, and it all depends on what age you're talking about, but yes, I can remember when, when uh, Josh or Matthew was just a little guy, I mean, he was like uh, 18 months old. He could not hardly even talk much. 
but he one day crawled up on a um, crawled up on a. We had a, a little a little hallway, and we had a water fountain in that hallway. So you had to squeeze by about. It was probably illegal, but it was about twenty four inches between the the fountain and the, and the wall of that particular area. Um, and he decided, somebody showed him, I don't know who it was, mm -hmm. that if you took your finger and turned the water, he's 18 months old, and pushed, pushed the water there, that it would fly everywhere. <laughs> he thought that was exciting, and we did fun things together. So he comes to get me, and he's saying, come on, and he's not, he's not talking that clear, but he wants to show me, and I know he's excited about something. And so mm -hmm. he, he, pulls, he pulls me up, he, and he pulls a chair up to that thing, and he and he shows me that you can do this. And I said, you can't do that. He said, he looked at me like, what do you mean? This is fun. And he, and he did it again. Like, right. you should be rejoicing. I'm showing you something exciting. And I said, you can't do that. And he decided he was going to throw a fit. It was after our services. People uh, were waiting for us at home. And, uh, and uh, so I call that a will-breaking ceremony. At that mm. point, I said, okay, here, that, that's, is, this isn't going to happen. That happened throughout their lives when, when, in different times that they would say uh, that they would be challenged. But I think this, I think if you give a reason, even mm. if they don't understand the reason, mm. if you give a reason for why you do what you do, mm. then, then at least they know you're, you, you are a reasonable person and, mm -hmm. I, and they'll, they'll, uh, even if they're, if, even if you're wrong, they'll accept that as long as they know that you love them. Um, there were times that, um, there were times that they wanted to do things that I, they, they couldn't do. I remember one time one of my sons said to me, dad, how come everybody else gets to do this mm -hmm. and I don't get to do that? And I would say, I said to him, look, here's the deal. In fact, this is what the statement was. The statement was, um, uh, statement was, I thought as a teenager, you're supposed to be able to sow your wild oats and then the rest of your life, the rest of your life, you're going to uh, look back at your teenage years and say, these were the best years of my life. I said, that's the wrong philosophy, mm -hmm. but that's the philosophy of the world. Mm -hmm. I said, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to train you to control your emotions. Mm. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that we need to teach ourselves to control our bodies. Mm. And I uh, can't think of the exact phrase, but uh, uh, control our passions. God allows us to have those passions between the time we're 13 and the time we're married so that we can learn how to control those passions. Mm. And I said to him, I said, you have passions, you have desires. If you, I said, do we have fun as a family? Oh yeah. Do, do we have a good time? Yeah. I said, you know why? Because when I was a teenager, I learned how to control my passions. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah. now we have a good time together. And when you explain that to them, I said, so I'm going to help you because this is what I want you to do. I want you to control yourself for, for the seven years of your teenage years mm -hmm. because then you're going to have 50 years of fun. Mm -hmm. We have fun because we controlled ourselves when we were teenagers. Amen. And um, so I think it's very important that we that we talk, we communicate with our children, and we, we make those things clear. By the way, we're not, we're not bad parents mm -hmm. if we have a rebellious son. God was a pretty good father, mm -hmm. and he had Adam and Eve in the garden. Right. Yes. And, uh, uh, and when they did wrong, he confronted them, and it mm -hmm. uh, wasn't that he was a bad parent. It was that they were tempted by the right. devil and, and, yes, uh, and gave in. Yes, sir. So, Amen. Amen. Now, Pastor Tice, I believe you have a you have a chapter in your book. I believe the the title is I think "Go for the Heart" or, or "Reach the Heart." And uh, could you could you let us know or explain to us the importance of cultivating the heart of your children, as opposed to just focusing on mere behavior modification? Okay, that's that's really good. I the last chapter is called mm. "Pursue Your okay, Child's yes. Heart," uh, and that's so so important. Mm. Uh, I think it's really important that they know that we love them and uh, that we they know that we care about them. Uh, I was just this past Sunday telling our, our people in our church that uh, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. My dad was about five foot ten and he was big around. 
and he had, uh, he died when I was 10 years old, but this is what I remember about him. He had a belt that went, went around his <laughs> waist. And when he said to do something, if he didn't do it, right. he could get that belt off yes. faster than anybody. Now, that some people would consider that child abuse. He wasn't abusive. He was just, you were going to do what he told you to do. Yes. So sometimes I did what I did because I, I feared, um, I feared him. I, I mean, I don't want to do it, but I'm going to do it. Yes. But there were other times, and a lot of times, I did what I did because I knew he loved me and I wanted his approval. Um, Christ, again, God in the garden, places Adam and Eve in the garden because he, he'd given them a place. He had taken care of them. Their home was special. Everything they needed was taken care of. There was a loving, compassionate, caring father that had taken care of every one of their needs. But when they did wrong, he confronted them and said, this is it. You're, you're out of the garden. Yes. Now, in, later, he said, okay, we're going to kill the animals. We're going to cover your sin. We're gonna, I'm going to send the Savior. Mm -hmm. All of that is true. But what he did was he dealt with. And I think, it's, I think sometimes we're, we, we are afraid to confront our children because they don't understand. If we're telling them to do something, they don't understand it. I, I think it's important that we not that sometimes it's just going to be behavior modification. Right. You need to change yes. what you're doing, and you'll understand later on. Mm, right. You need to brush your teeth because right. your teeth are going to rot out. You're not going to understand this, but brush right. your teeth. Right. Whether you understand it or not, uh, uh, you're going to go to school. You're going to eat your vegetables whether you understand it or not. Now, mm. we always tried to explain ourselves, but if they didn't understand, um, uh, we said, this is what you're going to do, and you'll understand later on. And right, right. Later, later they understood. Yes, uh, so uh, I can remember one time my, my son, Matt, oh, there was a, a fad that was going around back in the 80s. And mm. the fad was, uh, maybe, not, maybe in the 90s, the fad was balloon pants. Right. And the boys <laughs> wore them, and the girls wore them, and everybody wore them. So, and, so I, and, I, and I thought, I thought, these things look effeminate. I didn't like them. Yes, and I said, now, son, you're not going to wear those. And he said, why? And I said, well, here's why. Mm -hmm. And I went through an entire spill about the unisex movement in the 1960s <laughs> and how everything was going towards this unisex movement. And, and boys are going to be dressing like girls and girls like boys. And I don't want to be part of that. Yes, I went through that whole detailed explanation. Mm -hmm. And he said, I said, now, does that make sense to you? He said, no. <laughs> and I said, well, let me ask you a question. Are you going to wear those, those uh, pants? What, are you going to roll up your pants sleeves or, or pant uh, legs when I'm gone? He said, no. I said, why? He said, because you're the dad and I'm mm. the son. And I'm supposed to uh, do what you tell me to do because that's yeah. what's best. Amen. Amen. I thought, good. I'm yes. going to take him buy him a pizza or something. <laughs> yeah, so... So, uh, Amen. yeah, I Amen. think I think it's important that we set a standard of right and wrong mm. and try to explain. But there are times we're just going to have to say this is it. Amen. Amen. Uh, I've always uh, heard the phrase that that rules without relationship breeds rebellion and rules with a relationship breeds a response. And uh, were there some practical things that you did with your children to, to build that relationship? Some of the fun things that you oh, did. Oh, yeah. That? We yes, had sir. a ball. Yes, I'll talk about some of those things tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> or I did this morning. Right. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, the, um, the, um, you know, we just determined. I mean, this is what I would do. On Saturday, I'd be out door knocking. Sometimes mm -hmm. I'd have the kids with me. Um, but not always. But I always determined that on Monday we were going to do something that was going to be a mini vacation every mm -hmm. Monday. And so I would be out visiting and I'd be thinking, what can I do fun? What mm -hmm. can I do that's fun right. with my kids? And, and sometimes it would be cleaning out the garage, which is not really a whole <laughs> lot of fun. But you can make anything you want fun. Mm -hmm. uh, we, would, uh, we would make tacos or something for the day. Mm -hmm. we, we would take trips out into the desert uh, and... Uh, uh, we would find, we'd walk out in the desert and find old pieces of metal and, and make targets out of them and throw rocks at them. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we were so poor we couldn't afford guns back then. Now, now we go out and shoot shoot things with guns. Yes, but um, uh, so, uh, but we just determined we uh, I we didn't have money for bikes, so we mm -hmm. built bikes. Oh, wow. We went camping together. I would borrow people's uh, tents and we would go camping uh -huh. together. Camping was a big thing. Mm -hmm. So we did things. 
I heard a guy named um, Gary Smalley mm. say that say that years ago he had a family seminar and he said that he had learned that people who camp together are mm. very close families yeah. and he said he couldn't figure out what the problem I mean what why that was the case because he wasn't really into camping mm. and he said he realized after talking to a lot of people that when you're camping, there's always a crisis. <laughs> and he said, crisis <laughs> bond together. Right, you're going right. through this, you're flooded out, and the, the right. rain's coming in the tent, you're right. there all night long, right, right. And, and, and it's miserable. Yes, it but is. the next morning, and, and six months from now, you look back and you're laughing oh, about yeah, it right. because you went through that together. <laughs> so um, I, we just did everything we could together. On, on Mondays, we walked through malls together. We went to... Uh, uh, Patch up. I remember in Las Vegas, there's a there's a plant and garden, a nursery, mm -hmm. and in that nursery they have it, it was a big thing that they had parrots and they had different animals at different sections when you were walking through the nursery. So we went to the nursery not to look at plants, oh, yes. but to look at the animals, and they thought they were going to a zoo. You know, so <laughs> those kind of things just just working at them. I have a list of a hundred things that I put together for, mm. our, for our people. I should have brought wow. up, should, should have brought a set of them. Just things that we did together as a family because amen. we wanted to have fun and we just had to be creative about it. Amen, amen, amen. Well, Pastor Tice, I'm gonna ask you uh, some questions about marriage now. Oh, okay. And uh, we're gonna switch over just a little bit here. And uh, first of all, uh, what are some ways that a husband and a wife can maintain a thriving marriage even after so many years? Okay. Well, we've been married for 43 years. Amen. Uh, I, uh, I, I continually am telling my wife how beautiful she is. Amen. <laughs> and uh, she says, oh, stop it. But uh, I believe this, that, that men need mm. admiration. Mm. And I think women need adoration. Mm. Wow. And when we focus on the needs of the other person, and not on ourselves, because we are basically, I, I confess this to God every day, I'm a selfish, self-centered person. Mm -hmm. When I come home at night, I want to come home, I want my wife to come and say, I'm here for you. <laughs> I want my kids to come up and say, and my, my kids to come up and say, Dad, Dad, come, sit in the couch. <laughs> just, just here's the remote. Watch what you want to watch. That's what I want my kids to say. I want my kids... That doesn't happen. And I'm supposed to be the head of the house, which means I'm supposed to be the head servant of the mm -hmm. home. So when I come home, I need to say to myself, listen, my wife has been dealing with five rowdy kids all day long. They're rowdy because they're like me. <laughs> and uh, and she's, she's, she's tired. She's worn out. And I need to think about her. And mm -hmm. that's an, a determination, something mm -hmm. you do. My wife. My wife would prepare the kids when I was coming home. Mm -hmm. She would say, uh, now look, your dad's coming home. It's going to be so exciting. He's going to be home in 15 minutes. It's going to be home. So when I went through the door, my, I, would go, I would go through the door, and uh, these kids would come running up like it was the most exciting thing in the world. Well, I didn't know. I just thought, I'm course, you know. But my wife had prepared them for that, that my mm -hmm. wife had prepared them oh, wow. to, to just – uh, make me feel special and mm. and to develop that relationship. So mm. I think it's very important that we get our eyes off of ourselves mm. and we get our eyes off of uh, and get our eyes on the other person. I, my wife and I like to watch Hallmark movies together, <laughs> and uh, so we watched uh, the other day the story of Michael Landon, okay. done by his son. Oh, and it was wow. done that back in 1999. Oh, wow. And he, his son got saved. Mm -hmm. uh, but he tells the story of how his father had left and blown them apart. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, that, in that statement, he says, it's time for me to, th the reason he was getting divorced, he said, son, you need to understand, it's time for me to think about me. Mm -hmm. It's never time to think about me. And when, when, we, when we, need to, we need to understand that my wife is more important than anything else in the world, she mm -hmm. gave herself to for me. Mm. My, my wife knows that I, I know that I'm the most important thing in the world to her. Mm. And we express that. That's not that we don't. Listen, my wife and I are the most bullheaded, opinionated people on the planet. Mm. Uh, I was with, uh, with a friend of ours named Kathy Rice. Her husband founded the Bill Rice Ranch mm. out in uh, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. I'm walking with her. She was in her 80s and I was in my 40s. And, she, and my wife said something and I said, Mrs. Rice, I said, 
I said, my wife is the most opinionated person. She has an opinion about everything. She's the most opinionated person in the world. And he, she said, Brother Tice, she had a high squeaky voice. She said, Brother Tice, she said, a woman's no good unless she has an opinion about everything. <laughs> and so I, I just think it's important mm. that we place their, their needs above ours. And if we do Definitely. that, we, 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 we can't believe the lie that there is some ideal relationship out there. Mm -hmm. Any two people living together on this planet That's are right. going to have conflict. If, if there's no conflict, right. then one of them is not important. Right. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. That's so good. Thank you. Amen. Admiration and adoration. Yes. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Are there uh, some other important qualities that you can think of and regular practices of a marriage that is healthy, whether it might be uh, dating or, or... Yes, we, we would... I got a book at my, at my house called how to date your mate. Mm -hmm. And we, we would come up with, I mean, dates that were cheap okay. because I was broke. So what we did was we walked around, we walked to the park and we walked mm -hmm. around the park and held hands. And, and I told her how beautiful she was. And mm -hmm. our, we would, we would uh, just do simple things. Uh, we, we would, uh, my, my wife and I like to just go home and watch a movie and eat popcorn now. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would, I would, uh, anytime I could think of something that was fun and we would try to from time to time uh, because my mother was there and there, again we were very cautious about who watched our children but we would just say like, tonight uh, you would uh, uh, we would go out and just enjoy time together my wife and I enjoy ministering to people though mm -hmm. and so we would go out on visitation together mm -hmm. and I think this is important I think that that having a spiritual relationship, mm -hmm. a social relationship, and a physical relationship mm -hmm. is is absolutely Amen. essential. And I think Amen. I think that uh, we need to be willing to express our needs. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we come home, we're exhausted, and, and she's exhausted, and he's exhausted, uh, and there has to be and and somebody's starting to get a romantic idea, and the other one's exhausted, mm -hmm. and there yes. there needs to just be an expression of need. You know, mm -hmm. I I need you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we're too proud to do that. And mm -hmm. so there's conflicts in marriage uh, over those things. So. Yes, sir. No, absolutely. Amen. Well, um, let me ask you this. Are, are there some safeguards and also some non-negotiables that husbands and wives ought to establish in order to protect their uh, marriage? Yeah. Let me give you a couple. Number yes, one, never, never talk about divorce. Mm -hmm. um, I, my mentor, Sumner Wemp, used to say, we have been married for 50 years, whatever he said. I mean, he's like, he got married to, for 62 years or mm -hmm. something before he went to heaven. But he used to say, he used to say about his wife, he said, we, we determined we were never, ever going to even talk about divorce. Now, mm -hmm. we've talked about murder several times. <laughs> <laughs> he, said, he said not divorce. <laughs> uh, you have to make that determination in your life Amen. because it's offered to you every day, all the time. Mm -hmm. It's just there. Mm -hmm. Number two, um, my my wife and my we both have we both have cell phones and we both have um we both have uh the internet mm -hmm. uh she has total and complete access to my mm -hmm. phone in fact if, right. if my phone rings it rings on her phone if oh, i get a text message she gets the text oh, message wow. okay. um uh i'm 65 years old but uh mm -hmm. i still have red blood flowing through my mm -hmm. veins and we, we just we're not uh, we're we're going to guard each other. That's right. Um, we uh, uh, then then also, I just determined years ago I would never ever counsel a woman by myself or be alone with a woman. And I, I remember one time, a couple of ladies came to me and said, "We want counseling from you." Mm. And I said, "Okay." And I brought my wife into the office, and they said, "Well, what's she doing here?" Mm. I said, "I never counsel a woman." Right. by myself yes, was they said that's ridiculous my my pa my former pastor went to and he, she named a well-known mm -hmm. university she said and he says he says your policy on that is absolutely ridiculous mm -hmm. i said well he may think it's ridiculous but i want you to understand i won't be running off with anybody because every time i talk mm -hmm. to a woman my wife's right. going to be there right Amen. and uh, she said well who's going to stop very boldly she said who's going to be the aggressor Mm. And I said, nobody, because my wife's right here. Right. And uh, I just think we need to protect ourselves. I think mm -hmm. that 
Again, that goes back to protecting. We protect our children. We need to protect our relationship. The number one most important relationship in the world, besides my relationship with Christ, is my relationship with my wife. Amen. And so Amen. I want to make sure Amen. that I protect that. And so I never be alone. Uh, with I'm, I mean, if I'm ever in a situation where, like, I'm for a couple of seconds, somebody's mm. walking through my office or something, I, I, I get nervous about that. <laughs> I do not want yes, sir. Even if nothing ever happens, right. The, right. the chance for an accusation is, is terrible. Mm -hmm. And so right. um, I use, uh, in Las Vegas, there's all sorts of terrible billboards all around. Mm -hmm. So I tell, I tell guys in our church, you need to use your sin visor. Mm -hmm. And when you're driving down the road and you see those billboards, uh -oh. put that sin, <laughs> sin visor down. Right, right. So you're not having to look at the, the that's garbage right. that's out there. That's right. there's, there's all sorts of things we can do to guard. And I think, I think that's so important. I think also when, God, when Satan puts a lustful thought in a man's uh, mind, mm -hmm. that he ought to, the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 5, he ought to think about his wife. Mm -hmm. He ought to think about, he ought to be continually, he's pretty mm -hmm. graphic. Right. He said, let her right. breast satisfy thee at all times. Right. He, he, he says, think about her. So how do I overcome when a lustful thought comes in my mind? Somebody walks by my car, somebody, mm -hmm. some, what, how do I overcome that? I, what I call it is a transfer, transfer your lust. Mm -hmm. you're, you're allowed to and you're commanded to, to right. be ravished with your wife's love. Right. So think about her, Amen. think about how beautiful she is Amen. and uh, focus on that. Amen. Amen. Now, along the lines of, of that subject, um, what, what, what advice would you have for somebody who has experienced infidelity within their marriage relationship or, or even a divorce? How do they move forward from that? Okay, a couple of things. Number one, in, infidelity is not the end of a marriage unless, and now it, it can be the end of a marriage. And, and I believe biblically, mm -hmm. and there are people who differ with me on this, but I believe biblically that, um, that if the unbelieving depart, let them depart. Mm -hmm. I believe that's, that's scriptural. I believe yes, that if there's immorality that Jesus said, um, Jesus said, if you, if you leave or if you, uh, uh, if you're married and, uh, and you divorce your, your wife, unless it's for the cause of fornication right. and you've committed adultery. Well, what's he saying? I think very simply he's saying that you're not causing her to commit adultery and you're not committing adultery. Adultery has already been committed. Mm -hmm. Adultery right. is the breaking of the marriage vows. Yes. So when somebody breaks the marriage vows, then they have, I believe, the permission to remarry. I believe mm -hmm. they're not they're not under bondage according to First Corinthians chapter right, seven. Right. So I, I would think that a person has the freedom to remarry, but I don't think necessarily that has to take place. Right. Right. Uh, I believe that forgiveness. Uh, the Bible talks about if they if if you've got if you're married to an unbelieving spouse and he chooses to stay with you, that you mm -hmm. stay with you. You stay with him, and yes, you do everything you can to encourage. Uh, encourage him. I am, I'm thinking right now about a, a young lady in our church uh, who married uh, a man who wasn't saved. And that, well, actually uh, he made a profession of faith. They mm. got married and then, right. uh, and he was just, he was going to go be drinking. He was going to do his thing. And uh, she decided uh, she needed to just be faithful to him and, unless he was unfaithful to her. Right. And right. she was faithful. She kept doing, she kept serving him at, at, one point he was seen to be very, very abusive, but because mm -hmm. of her submissive heart towards him and mm -hmm. her, her uh, relationship to him, uh, it's amazing what God has done and the children that she's raised are godly Amen. servant children. She, because, because he wasted his money on gambling, mm -hmm. she had to pull her kids out of a Christian school. Mm -hmm. and, but it wound up being great for her because she wound up homeschooling her children and her children are just gems. I mean, I just mm, can't wow. say more about them. And and not only that, she's affected her husband in such a positive way. Amen. So, um, so now if there is infidelity and the person leaves, and uh, can a person remarry personally? And again, I don't know what your position is on this, so I'm I'm not stating this for him, yes, but. My, my my belief my belief is that you you're free to remarry, but and, and uh, I agree with that. But uh, but there will be difficulties. Mm. Um, I I think at the end of the book that I've written, uh, raising God's kids in Chin, Sin City, um, I think I do a chapter on the blended family, mm. and uh, uh, I just believe this. You can go in the Old Testament. I think the greatest example is David and Bathsheba. Mm. David and Bathsheba 
messed up big, mm-hmm. right. big time. I mean, their relationship started with immorality, mm-hmm. the murder of Bathsheba's husband, uh, the, the death of their baby. Mm-hmm. What a horrible relationship. What I mean, what right. a terrible thing. That's and right. yet, the Bible tells us, I think it's in 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 Proverbs chapter four or five, mm. David says, I, or Solomon says, let me tell you what I've learned from my mother and what I learned from the knee of my father. Right. And he talks about how to manage your life. Well, David didn't let his past failures cause him not to be able to raise his children right. And Solomon became the greatest king of wow. Israel uh, because he poured into him. Now, did, did Solomon follow some of his mistakes? Yes. But what I'm, but the point is, he he didn't let his past failures uh, hinder the rest of his life. Some people, uh, they they've gotten a divorce, their spouse is off, and they, and their focus the rest of their life is on that. No, the focus is on Jesus. Lord, help me to become what you want me to be. Help me to live the way you want me to live. And then the Bible says, "He that findeth a wife findeth a good thing." The idea there is, I'm walking along, and all of a sudden. This thing appears in my, in my, and I can I can go ahead and I can go for that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In in the Corinthian church, there there were all sorts of immoral problems, and Paul so Paul says, look, I'm going to address things that Jesus didn't address mm-hmm. because he was dealing with a bunch of Jewish people who knew the law. I'm dealing with a bunch of people who've lived all sorts of perversion, mm-hmm. and here's how to live. First Corinthians chapter seven mm-hmm. to, talks about about the unmarried. It talks about the widow. And it talks about the virgin, mm. those three categories. Yes, sir. And he says about all of them, it's better to marry than to burn. Mm. And uh, uh, he says, hey, if you can stay like me, that's great, but very few are mm. going to do that. So it's better, but make sure that they're in the Lord. And so rebuilding, first rebuild your life and then let God bring the person. Amen. 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 Well, I have one final uh, question for you, Pastor Tice, okay. and uh, that is what are some resources that, that you can recommend for us uh, so that we can grow when it comes to our parenting and also our marriage relationships. Okay, let me give you a couple of things. Number one, there's this great book called Raising God's Kids. In Sin City. <laughs> I would encourage you to yes. get that book. Uh, awesome book. <laughs> uh, I, I think this, I think it's very difficult, especially for moms mm. um, of children to get into reading books. We're going to take mm. that book and we're putting it on audio oh. so that uh, and so that people can... Uh, listen to it because moms okay. are very, very busy, right? But they right. can listen to, uh, audio messages oh, yes, and they can listen to audio books. Great idea. Um, yes, there's a book, there's a book, uh, a book called love and respect. Mm. Excellent book mm. talks about the fact that a woman needs that love. She needs that emotion, but a man needs respect mm. admiration. As we yes, talked sir. about earlier. Yes, good, good book. Uh, books by James Dobson. I mean, he he's the foremost uh, expert. I mean, not that everything he says I would agree with, yes, sir. but my we've read book after book after book. My daughters and my uh, uh, my daughters will read uh, those books, and uh, they'll say, "Dad, you teach exactly what he taught." <laughs> so he's been around a lot. He's been around a lot longer than I have, and I read his books and we watched his stuff, and and so I would say podcasts are very very important. Mm, yes. uh, I have a podcast called Tice Talks. Um, Joshua has a Tice uh, a a, a uh, podcast called um, Bible Talks. Him and him and Heather talk okay. Okay. on there. Really yes, good. Sir. Uh, I there's others. I'm t- trying to think of a guy named Gary. Uh, Anyway, there's some really good podcasts okay. for ladies to listen to. Oh, let me give you one really good. And I, I, this is these are for devotions for ladies. Mm. Um, my my daughter Charity mm. has a website called um, it's called EFW Encouragement from Women okay. who've been there. Oh, and what okay. she's done is she's got she's gathered short devotionals mm. um, from. Uh, from Christian ladies across the country and around the world, missionaries, uh, pastors' wives, uh, uh, just all sorts of wonderful people who are, who, they just write these devotionals for ladies. And that's very, very helpful. I would, if, if uh, I think it's important that uh, we understand we cannot be, um, we live in a very fast paced world. Mm-hmm. 
when I when it comes to the Bible, I used to read try to read through the Bible once a year. Mm. I now listen to the Bible mm. on the on the, the YouTube Bible or whatever it's That's called. Right. <laughs> uh, I, I listen to it four times a year, oh, yeah. and so. Uh, because I want to hear the Bible. Mm. So, so you can do a lot of things like that. And, and there's so many good articles and so many good books. Uh, mm. But those are some of the books. Now, was the website, your, your daughter's website, is that EFW.com or is it Encouragement for Women? I or? think you can, I think it's just EFW. Okay. If you look on EFW or if you look at, uh, I mean, she's, it's amazing to me. That's she's right. got like 900,000 ladies that, oh, wow. I mean, I don't mean to exaggerate that. I, I mean, yes, it just has exploded because wow. it's simple. Amen. It's like like she might call it your wife and ask your wife mm-hmm. to, to do a devotional. Anybody mm-hmm. that she knows, I she see. gets a women who've been there and have experienced mm-hmm. ministry things. And it was first just for pastor's wives to encourage mm-hmm. pastor's wives. I but see. these women got on it and it's exploded. Wow. So wow. Uh, anyway, it's Amen. I think that's important. I think it's important that men get books that are that are focused on them. And the book, the couple of books that I've, I've mentioned are, are, are on, mm-hmm. um, are on audiobook. Audiobook okay. is great. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, Pastor Tice, thank you so much once again for being with us here this weekend. And this has been so good and so very encouraging for each and every one of us. And uh, could you close us in a word of prayer and uh, just pray for those that are watching okay. and also pray for our church. That would be a right. blessing. Well, I would like to say it's been a joy to be able to be here and be able to see, meet you uh, and see you again. I mean, it's been so, it's been so long. I don't know how many years. Yes, sir. <laughs> so uh, thank you for allowing me to be here. Amen. Thank okay. You. Father, thank you so much for the privilege of being able to... Uh, share your truth. Thank you for family. God, uh, thank you for establishing the family as the first institution. Mm -hmm. Uh, And Father, thank you for the privilege of having a family. Father, help us to remember that this is a precious gift that people, Father, especially we in America, we have we have the privilege of being able to raise our children to honor you. And uh, Father, we've, we've got so much freedom we pray that you protect our, our freedoms. We pray, Father, that you'd help us, remind us daily about how important our relationship is with our spouse, how important our relationship is with our children. Mm-hmm. And I pray, Father, for those here at Hillcrest. I pray, Father, that you would bless them. I pray, Father, as they're, they're hearing these truths, that God will impact them for life. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, once again, thank you so much for joining us tonight for our evening service. I pray that the message and the Q&A session was a wonderful encouragement to you and your family. And I pray it can be an encouragement and a challenge as we strive to move forward for the Lord throughout this week. Well, before we close the service, I have a few announcements for you. And I just want to remind you, we have our golf fellowship outing. That's on Saturday, October the 17th at 8.30 in the morning. The cost per golfer is $40, and you can register on our website, visit healthpress.org slash golf. And then also on the week of October the 18th, we will be starting once again our life groups for this upcoming quarter. It is track four, and uh, we have several different options on life groups that you can join. So let me encourage you to go to our website, visit healthpress.org slash life groups, and register, enroll for one of these life groups that are coming up. And I know that the Bible study and the fellowship time that we spent together will be a tremendous blessing and an encouragement to you throughout your week. And so don't forget, sign up life groups starting in just a few weeks. Well, as we close our service, we're going to finish with one final song. And so let's lift up our voices and open our hearts and let's sing unto the Lord as we close our service here tonight. Once again, thanks for joining us here for our Sunday evening worship service. If you need anything at all or have a prayer request, please let us know by filling out the connection form found on our website at visithillcrest.org slash live. We're going to sing one final song before we dismiss. We're going to sing There's Power in the Blood. We'll sing it on the very first and we'll dismiss tonight with this song, Would You Be Free from the Burden of Sin?
for joining us here tonight. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you right here on our live stream next Sunday night at 5 p.m.